You know, in the beginning of this uh, essay, uh, Feldman uh, mentions the possibility that Epicurus may be a sophist, that his argument about that may be sophistry. And I said that, you know, sophistry or a sophistical argument is one that is unsound uh, and that seeks to convince us of something that we, we really deeply feel is, is untrue. Um, and I think that what we see in the next section, uh, things that are bad for people, is uh, Feldman's attempt to show where the, the unsoundness is in Epicurus's argument, and it's not in his the validity of his reasoning uh, that, that his argument is unsound, it's in the, the premises, or the presumed premises. The, the interpretation of, of Epicurus's argument is that because we cannot experience after death, when death occurs, once death occurs, that, that nothing, um, nothing bad can happen to us because all bads are experienced bads. All bads are states of, of, of pleasure or pain. And, and I guess Feldman is kind of accepting that. He's saying he accepts that Epicurean axiology. But I, what he goes on here to accuse the Epicurean of, of doing is of, of not taking into account certain distinctions with regard to bad things. And this should be a kind of a familiar way of arguing, because if we just leave it at Epicurus's, at least this interpretation of what Epicurus means, that, that for something to be bad for someone, they have to directly suffer. And it's the suffering that constitutes the bad. Then Epicurus wins. Because under the presumption that death is the annihilation of the person, and, and we're, we're just going under that assumption because we're not taking into account other metaphysical ideas of the continuance of the person in some form of resurrection and things like that. We're putting it aside just for the sake of, of a philosophical inquiry. But if we presume that, that death is a total annihilation of the person, then, then, then of course one cannot experience those sort of bads those experienced baths. One cannot suffer, just as one cannot experience joy or anything else. So, some distinction has to be made in order to overcome Epicurus, and, and it should be fairly familiar the kind of distinction that Feldman does make uh, on page 314. He asks the general question, what do we mean to say that something would be bad for someone? And he goes on to say, it seems to me that when we say that something would be bad for someone, we might mean either of two main things. The first one is uh, when we say something would be intrinsically bad, that one would be the subject or the experiencer or the recipient of the bad, and this would be uh, be constituted by pain, painful experiences. He says, given our assumed hedonistic axiology, the only things that could be intrinsically bad for someone would be his own pains. This is ruled out, right? by what we're saying, the annihilation of the person. And here's what's important. On the other hand, when we say that something would be bad for someone, we might mean that it would be, quote, all things considered bad for him. At least in some instances, this seems to mean that he would be, all things considered, worse off if it were to occur than he would be if it were not to occur. This is the move that he makes, and this is where he has to invoke possible worlds, because now we're talking about the... The, the value of someone's life, the, the amount of pleasure and pain, basically, that one experiences, uh, d affected by the event in question. Uh, and then we begin to compare the possible worlds, the, wo the ones in which the event occurs and the ones in which the event does not occur. Um, he gives an example of someone named Dolores moving to Bolivia. He says, consider an example. Suppose we are interested in the question whether mo moving to Bolivia would be a bad for Dolores. Because would it be a bad thing for Dolores to move to Bolivia? Intuitively, this question seems to be equivalent to the question whether Dolores would be worse off if she were to move to Bolivia than she would be if she were to refrain from moving to Bolivia. Letting B indicate the state of affairs Dolores moves to Bolivia, we can say this. B would be all things considered bad for Dolores if, and only if, she would be worse off if B obtained than she would be if B did not obtain. 
Now, if we employ the standard account of the meaning of subjunctive conditionals, the, the were, you know, the subjunctive, uh, if she were to go to Bolivia, together with the assumptions about values of worlds for individuals, that's a possible world thing, we can rewrite this as follows. B would be, all things considered bad for Dolores, if and only if the value for Dolores of the nearest possible B world is less than the value for her of the nearest possible not B world. That is, the value of a world for Dolores is all the pleasures uh, minus all the pains that she experiences in that world. And one world can be compared to another uh, insofar as one can calculate the total uh, sum when we add together the pleasures and pains, and we can even assign them a number. You know, he says that uh, uh, we can then, um, you know, we assign those numbers, then we compare the values of possible worlds. That is to say that if Dolores does move to Bolivia, she has a lot of bad experiences, and her total, the total value, when we add up all the pleasures and pains to her, if she moves to Bolivia, is, what does he say? Uh, I don't think he gives it a... Well, he says that, you know, it, considering all the pleasures and pains she would ever experience, her life would be worth plus 100 points. Thus, the value for Dolores of the nearest world in which she moves to Bolivia is plus 100. This is the bottom of page 315. Suppose, on the other hand, that the value for her of the nearest world in which she does not move to Bolivia is plus 1,000. Then she would be 900 units worse off if she were to move to Bolivia, and the value of her moving to Bolivia is minus 900. So this way of comparing possible worlds uh, is, is, I think, is quite interesting. That is, if Dolores moves to Bolivia, the, the total value of her life would be plus 100. If she doesn't move to Bolivia, the possible world in which she doesn't move to Bolivia is plus 1,000, and that gives us a way of comparing the, her welfare in these possible worlds in a quantitative way, and, and it ends up that uh, she's 900 units worse off. And this is, is he admits, a very crude axiology if she were to move to Bolivia. So, um, he immediately goes on then, once we've got this possible world thing, to, com to, to use it to talk about the evil of death. Uh, we'll do a video on that, but it's pretty, pretty obvious how this is going to work then. Um, instead of moving to Bolivia, let's say Dolores dies um, at, you know, age 70. Uh, then we, uh, her life then has a certain unit value, right? If we add up all the pleasure and pains that she experiences. In another possible world, Dolores lives to 80. Uh, then in that possible world, we can add up all the pleasures and pains. And if in that other possible world in which she lives in, in, until 80, her total welfare number ends up being uh, larger than the one in which she dies at 70, then we have a means to say that, that something bad happened to her when she died because the event of her death caused her... Um, to have a total unit value of, of, of let's say, welfare of her good, uh, less than a possible world uh, in which she lived ten years longer. But that's that's just a hint at, at what he's getting at. But I think that that he immediately goes on to show how we can use this possible world thing and his own axiology to make certain claims about why death can be said to be bad for a person.